Today's passage in the, uh, what are they called? Pew Bibles, is on page 969. This is 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 4 through 5. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God, and take every thought captive to obey Christ. Amen. I love that last song. It's powerful, powerful song. And that passage is powerful. It's a powerful song about the warfare that we wage against the enemy of our minds and our souls. Uh, This uh, topic has been a tough one to wrestle with this week and have received many uh, uh, texts and um, messages and talked to a lot of people this week. Uh, My dad, even this morning, sharing a story with me, a family that he's visiting. And and so it is... um, it is with fear and trembling that I approach this, uh, but yet boldly to the throne of God in seeking answers, um, seeking His, His will in, in the midst of, of trials and stress and anxiety, which we all have, have had to deal with at times, some of us greater than others. Why don't we first go to the Lord in prayer and ask Him to speak this morning. Father, we do recognize that, uh, that this is uh, confusing territory. Lord, that the mind and the spirit are mysterious to us. Lord, it, we still feel like we only have a little small grasp on what all goes through the mind and how to heal the mind. And, and your, Lord, we also recognize that that, that it's, it's infused with our spirit, that we aren't just physical, but we also are spiritual beings. And, and how that is intertwined is, is a mystery to us. And Lord, we need you who, who created us, who designed us. Lord, we recognize that you know us more than we know ourselves, that someday we will fully know you, even as we are fully known, as you say in your word. Lord, we thank you that you fully know us. And Lord, you also came into this world and you weren't immune to our trials and our anxieties. Lord, you know what it is to mourn. You know what it is to to agonize as you did in the garden before you went to the cross. And Lord, um, we, we just go to you knowing that you understand all of it. And we thank you for that, Jesus. Speak to us afresh this morning. May it be your words and not mine. In your name we pray, amen. So I don't have all the answers to this subject. Uh, Stress, anxiety, depression, uh, fight, the fight for joy, how to fight for joy. And, And yet it's heavy on my heart as I have had certain instances happen throughout my life of people that I love and care about that has caused me to really agonize over this at times. When Heidi and I were in Chicago, there was a close uh, family that we ministered to their kids because we helped out in the youth group and they had two kids in the youth group. And the the mother seemed like such a a wonderful woman that didn't have any problems, it seemed like. They they were a very wealthy family in the Chicago suburbs. and they went through a horrific event right after we left Chicago. The mother ended her life with two kids in middle school. It's like the toughest time for kids. You're in middle school, you're transitioning into adulthood, and the mother ended her life. Her husband was supposed to be the one that found her, but it ended up being her son. And I remember just being so broken about that. Like, why? How does this happen? How does somebody come to this point? My sister is uh, bipolar as well as schizoaffective. And schizoaffective looks like schizophrenic at times. Uh, My sister has had many episodes where uh, she ended up in the uh, psych ward in the hospital. And she has on medications, and those medications are a blessing from God for her. 
I have a cousin who was abducted and forced to be a sex slave in Japan. She was in and out of psychiatric hospitals most of her life. And yet recently, in the last probably 10 years or so, has really found peace with the Lord and has embraced her relationship with the Lord. Continual, it has been a a fight for her as she shared with me. I'm gonna share some of the things she said later on in the sermon. But as she shared with me, I could see that there was this constant fight over PTSD and, and, and anxiety and depression that she struggled with throughout her life because of that event. And because of never seeing justice in that event. So my heart is wide open for anyone that is struggling with depression or stress or anxiety or PTSD. I have people that I love and care about and even people in this church that have come to me and talked to me about some of their stresses and anxieties. And a lot of it has to do with past past trauma in their life that affects them still to this day. It's with a heavy heart that I go to the Lord and ask him for for his wisdom, for his insight on this. What is the Lord's will? And so we're gonna go through a, a number of passages through the Psalms, as we see a really an awesome example in David, Philippians 4, 6, and 2 Corinthians 10, 4 through 5. 2 Corinthians 10, 4 through 5 will be our main scripture, the main text this morning that we will go back to consistently. Uh, In 2 Corinthians, Paul is very concerned about the mind of the Corinthians. And if you remember, the the, the Corinthians are probably the most like the American church today. They were not persecuted like many of the other churches. They were wealthy, uh, and yet they had so much sin and confusion and corruption in that church. A lot of hypocrisy that Paul deals with in the first letter to the Corinthians. In the second letter to the Corinthians, he's like encouraging them because they have responded well to his first letter, and yet there are still many concerns. And one of the big concerns that we see can come up again and again in 2 Corinthians is the struggle of the mind. And I'm going to kind of walk you through this, okay? Uh, uh, Chapter 2, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11 He says this, so that we would not be outwitted by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his designs. This mental ignorance and outwitting by Satan, how Satan outwits us, and he tried to do that with Christ, and Ryan spoke about that last week, how Satan just attacked Christ at his weakest moment, and then he left Christ for the opportune time. Doesn't Satan look for the perfect time to attack us when we're stressed, when we're filled with anxiety, when we're overwhelmed, when we're exhausted? The enemy will attack us. And that's what he did to our Savior. And our Savior overcame on our behalf. And that is what Ryan spoke about last week. And he's saying this, Paul is saying to the Corinthians, don't be outwitted in your mind, Okay? Then moving on to verse, or chapter 3, verse 14. Chapter 3, verse 14, it says this. But their minds were hardened. For to this day, when they read the old covenant, that same veil remains unlifted because only through Christ is it taken away. And he's talking about the Jewish people who could not see the new covenant in Christ because there was this blindedness in their minds that they could not see. That word mind, the same word is used throughout Corinthians a number of times. It's the same word used in 2 Corinthians 10, 4 through 5 that Heidi just read. Uh, The word is noioma. It's the same Greek word used for thoughts and mind. Sometimes it's translated as thought. Sometimes it's translated as mind. Moving on to Chapter 4, verse 4. Chapter 4, verse 4. To kind of give you a feel for this is a theme throughout. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. You see, the church that was most like us today were blinded 
They were blinded by legalism and they were blinded by the God of this world, Satan, tricking them, deceiving them. So often we are blinded in the same way. So we see this throughout, this this concern for the mind of the Corinthian church. Chapter 11, verse three. Surrounding chapter 10 that we just read, 11, verse three. But I am afraid that as the serpent serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts, again that word naoma, or naoma, Naoma, I believe. Thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. I'm afraid that they're being deceived. And then we go to chapter 10, verse four through five, our main text this morning. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds, We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought, again, that Greek word for mind, every thought captive to obey Christ. We're gonna dig into that in a little bit, but before we dig into that, I wanna talk about where depression comes from and and many times where it comes from, it comes in all different forms and everybody's story is different when struggling with depression and there's all types of levels of depression. So when you use the word depression, you'll find that people react differently. Everyone reacts differently because everyone has a different idea of what that word actually means. Is it clinical depression? Is it a time of sadness? where you just feel oppressed in some way and, 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 and you're, or you're struggling? Is it a situ, situational type depression, which what we see with, with David a lot? Situational depression can also plague a person. If you struggle with situational depression, a way to tell that is to ask a couple questions of yourself. What do you set your mind on to love? What do you love? What do you long for? Do you tend to be happy when you have something fun planned for the day? Something exciting? Do you tend to be happy in those moments? And then do you tend to be real grumpy and irritable in the daily routine of life, the daily grind of life? Or when you know you have to deal with a conflict with a person? Or when your bank account is very low? Et cetera, et cetera. These are situational uh, trials that come in our life that tend to bring us down. And, and the scriptures have a lot to say about that. They have a lot to say about that, not just in the Psalms, but throughout the scripture. We know with, with uh, Paul in Philippians, he said, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say, rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always in every situation. You see, David gives us a good example in the Psalms for us today because he struggled with situational depression. He was down at the depths many times. You read through the Psalms and there's this lamenting of all of the the, the pain that he's going through and agony, but he always comes out of it. And the way that he comes out of it is clear throughout the Psalms and it is truly a delighting in the Lord. If you look at Psalm 1611, 198, and 119, 92 through 94, there are many others, but these are ones that I'm gonna focus on because they clearly talk about the word joy and what it is to delight in something. Psalm 1611, he says this, you make known to me the path of life. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. That's where David's hope was, set, was delighting in the Lord, the Lord making known the path of life, and in his presence there is fullness of joy, not just a temporary happiness that comes and goes, but fullness of joy. Psalm 19.8 says, the precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. Rejoicing the heart, causing the heart to leap with feelings of joy, not just cognitive thinking, but, but feelings of joy. It rejoices the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. Enlightening the eyes. 
You see, when darkness is coming in, it depresses our hearts. But when light is coming in, it gives life to our hearts and to our minds. And that light is the truth of God's word, the truth that remains strong and firm throughout whatever situation comes our way. Psalm 119, 92 through 94. This one's probably my favorite of all three of these. If your law had not been my delight, I would have perished in my affliction. I will never forget your precepts, for by them you have given me life. I am yours, save me, for I have sought your precepts. If your law and your truth, and your word, he's talking about the words of God, if they had not been my delight, I would have perished when the time of trial came. When we're delighting in the right thing. So the question is, what are we delighting in? He said, David said the example by his delight being in the right thing. When our delight is in lesser things, it's easy for our heart to become sick. I had somebody talk to me this last week and they shared about a time in their life when they had had all of their eggs in one basket and when that basket flipped up and all of the eggs crashed and they didn't get the job that they wanted, they went into a severe depression. This is long ago in their life. They said a severe depression of many years of turning to really self-medication through alcohol and drugs because that was the only thing that they knew to do at that time, to deal with the pain that they were going through. This happens to so many people. If this, if this is your testimony, this was somebody in the church, this is a believer. If this, is, if this is something that's happened to you, know that you're not the only one and know that God can redeem whatever it is that you've gone through and can put your delight in the right thing by stirring up in your heart a desire for God and his will and his glory and his word that never changes. It is so easy for us to get caught up because the world around us is all about putting our, all of our eggs in one basket, is it not? Then the question is, so can we not be sad when hard times come? Can we not mourn when hard times come? Of course we can. We see Jesus doing that. We see David doing that, mourning, going through severe sadness. Yet in that sadness, there is a deep kind of joy that you can experience in the midst of that sadness. And the only way I've found how to, how to have that joy is to experience the presence of the Lord in a deep way. Because you can always identify with the Lord in your sadness and crying out to him. Paul said, when I'm weak, I'm strong. When I'm broken, I'm hurting. I'm being tempted. I'm struggling with something in my life. When I'm weak, I'm strong because his grace is sufficient. I cling to him during those times and when I cling to him, I become stronger and I grow through those times. That is the Lord's will for us. Some of the closest times with God can be in the midst of great trials. Did you know that? Some of the closest times with God can be in the midst of great trials. So don't let the trial be wasted. Think about it that way. Don't let the trial be wasted and the enemy steal the incredible joy that God longs to give to you. Don't let that trial be wasted. Cling to him and to his word. And what I've found is many times, if we have a habit, a long habit in life of clinging to the world's uh, definition of joy, if we have a long time in life where we cling to that, then, then, we, then it's very hard to change that habit. It's hard to change habits, is it not? You know, for, uh, for my grad school, I had to uh, uh, fast for something for 30 days, pick whatever it was that I could fast from. And, and so I picked sugar, because I'm, I really like sugar. And it was difficult. It was tough. But by the end, I saw some new habits forming in my life that were better. It takes time. It takes a fight for joy. When you grew up, say you grew up in a very negative home, where joy was absent in your home, it's going to be more of a fight for you than somebody who grew up in a more joy-filled home. That's just a fact. It's going to be more of a fight. But don't give up on the fight. 
Don't give up on the fight because God has something better in store for you than, than those times. I love how uh, Job went through this horrible trial in his life and it says at the end of his life that, J- that the end of Job's life was better than the beginning. It was better than the beginning. God has something, and, and if you grow through those trials and you fight for joy, man, you will come out of that, of that trial and out of that darker time into a vastness of life where you'll be able to help so many people that struggle with that same thing. And so many people do. So many people do. To different degrees. So the world has its own definition of joy. I think of the American type definition of happiness, the pursuit of happiness. What does that look like in America? Well, I think a lot of times it looks like a nice house in the suburbs, a good job, good paying job, kind of like the friend of ours from Chicago. Had it all together. And yet in the end, as, as Solomon says in Ecclesiastes, it is a striving after the wind. If that is it, It is a striving after the wind. What is the definition of joy as a Christian? Uh, John Piper gives an amazing uh, definition of joy. I love this definition of joy. He says this. It is one, a good feeling in the soul produced by the Holy Spirit as he causes us to see the beauty of Christ in the word and in the world. Now, breaking that down, okay, it's a good feeling. It's something that I cannot produce on my own. A feeling is something that that happens to me, right? It happens. If I I see something really, really scary, like, um, you know, I've never had this happen, but I knew other people out west when they would be elk hunting or something, I would go elk hunting. I never was successful. But I, I knew of somebody that was elk hunting, and he felt like something was watching him. You ever felt like that? You know, someone's watching you? Sometimes it's It is happening, and other times it's not. And he turned around, and there was a cougar just staring at him. If that would happen to me, I would not have to go, hmm, um, that's a cougar. How should I feel in this situation? (laughs) Immediately, it would just happen to me. I would just feel fear, and I would want to run, but then my mind would probably tell me, don't run, because it'll chase you. And then I maybe would just freeze and just pass out. I don't know. But... A feeling is something that happens to us. Okay? The cool thing about that is God commands us in Scripture to feel things that we are not capable of producing of our own, on our own. We are not capable of producing some of these feelings. We are told to have a healthy fear of the Lord. How do you have a healthy fear of the Lord? Well, you start to see him in, in light of who he is. The creator of the entire universe Not just a little buddy like Santa Claus type figure, but the God, the King of Kings, who is a judge sitting on a throne. That is a healthy fear of the Lord. We're also called to to have the peace from the Lord and and that his love actually cast out the negative type of fear. So to feel the peace and the love of the Lord, how do you have that? Well, you start to look at the cross and how that that creates peace between us fallen sinners and a holy, perfect God. The fear is often what causes us to see our need for the cross. So you start to have correct doctrine and correct focus on the scriptures. And as you study and you know God more, it produces in you this feeling that does not come natural on on our own. It's a feeling in the soul, in the soul. That's important as well, because as believers, we know that we have this soul that is not just a physical, we're not just physical beings, we're spiritual as well. And we declare that to a world that, 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 that is starting to seem, seemingly believe in this humanistic, atheistic uh, naturalism that, that only believes in the physical and not the spiritual. But we know that those feelings of joy that are produced in our soul and our heart that you cannot measure in a science lab is something that God has given us. It is our soul. We are created in the very image of God. And so it's a feeling. It's a good feeling in the soul. How is it produced? It's produced by the Holy Spirit. By the Holy Spirit. It's produced by the Holy Spirit. And as he causes us to see the beauty of Christ, the beauty of Christ in his word 
And the more we know him, the more we see the beauty of Christ and in the world around us. And those are connected. The word and the world are connected because the world can be a very chaotic place. And then we see in scripture that we're told that it's going to be chaotic and it's going to be tough and it's going to be, uh, we're going to have trials in life. Jesus never said it was going to be easy. He never said that it's just going to be, you know, once you accept Jesus, it's just always, you know, everything's going to be perfect and fine and you're going to feel, you're going to feel good all the time. Everything's going to go well for you. No, there are going to be trials in life and the life is chaotic because of sin and death that entered into this world. But we always see that word come up in scripture, do we not? The word but. Don't you love that word in scripture? In, in, in the Old Testament, there, there is a, a passage that I love that I often think of. It says that, that we all must die. We are like water spilled on the ground that cannot be gathered up again. But God does not take away life. And he devises means by which the banished one will not remain an outcast. So we see that word but in capital letters. And we recognize that God is a God of redemption. And that is how we see him in the world. And then we see that he has called us to be ambassadors of reconciliation, crying to the lost and confused world, light and truth and the gospel that will save so many people stuck in their sin. And so many people stuck in the confusion of their mind that we see Paul talking about here in 2 Corinthians 10, four through five. There are some steps that we need to take though when it comes to fighting for joy. What are the steps? One, the first step is, do you want joy? Do you want this joy? Now that may seem like a weird question, does it not? Well, of course I want that joy. Jesus asked the, the, the uh, lame man who had been in, in an invalid for 38 years. 38 years this guy had been an invalid. And, he, and as Jesus came to him, he kind of had all these excuses as to why he can't get healed. And Jesus asked him a question that echoes throughout the centuries to us today. And that is, do you want to get well? Do you want to get well? Why would Jesus ask him that? My experience in ministry is that you do have people, yes, that want to get well. Maybe sadness is all that they know, but they don't know how to get well. They may not know how to get well. You also have those, and this is, this is something that, that people will have a hard time hearing, but it is very true. You have those who are constantly wanting attention. And they really don't want to get well. And I have to, like many times, when I was a youth pastor, man, this was a tough one because when I was first a youth pastor, the fad came out of cutting. It was so annoying. This, it was like a big fad. I'm like, I never, like, nobody ever talked about that when I was in, in, in school. We had, we had our issues. Every generation has their issues, I really believe, like, like strongholds. And the stronghold of the generation when I was as a youth pastor was cutting. Cutting was such a big thing. And I would have countless kids come to me and say, I struggle with cutting. And it was such a hard thing to know how to deal with because I didn't want to just discount it because I didn't know how serious it was. But yet many times, usually the ones that came to me and told me that they struggled with it was because it was like a I want attention. Usually it was that. And what I learned to start doing was ask them to show me. And so many times it was just like they took a paper clip and just kind of put some scratches. Does that make sense? It was like, I just, I don't really want to cut myself, but I really want attention really bad. So they would do that. But so many people have this desire for attention. They want to stay in the victim type mentality. They want to be a victim. Sometimes we want to do that. Sometimes when something has gone bad for us, we want everyone to know, I have to, I have to catch myself on this. I, I mean, I'm guilty of it at times. When something goes bad in our house, and we've had many of those things go bad, you know, it's like, am I putting this on Facebook to let people know how to pray for me? Or am I putting this on Facebook because I want everybody to feel, oh, poor TJ, you know, he has it so rough. You know, I really have to, I really struggle with that at times because don't we all want attention at times? Don't we all want people to feel bad for us when we're going through a trial? We all want that at times. So the question that echoes throughout the centuries is, do you want joy? Do you want to get well? The second step 
is this, diagnose the problem. Now, I had somebody post on the church's site um, because we advertised about this and I wanted people in the community, maybe somebody who's struggling with this issue that they would want to come and, and, and hear what, what God has to say about this. And they said, I shouldn't talk about it because I'm not a doctor. And, uh, and I, I agree, I'm not a doctor. And this, I am going into territory that I don't know all everything about it, that is for sure. But I know a great physician, and, and, and he knows way more than any doctor in this world because he made me and he created us and he tells us in his word how to fight these things. However, we do see moments and times where somebody has a psychological issue. And how do you tell when it's a psychological, clinical depression and when it's just a time of sadness? That has always been a struggle for me in ministry. How do I know when it's really, really severe? Uh, my, my dad was telling me a story about my cousin. Uh, just the sweetest kid growing up. I, I, last time I saw him, he was, he was a little kid. I have like so many cousins. I probably have like 70 some cousins. So many cousins. This kid was such, he was so filled with joy. Well, when he was, it, just recently, his house burned down, his family's house burned down, and he lost his job. And he's, this is a special needs kid. Special needs kid. That often compounds, the, makes it m more of a problem, okay? When it's someone with special needs. And he got into a deep, dark depression where he would not even eat. His parents had to even feed him. He would not even eat. It was that bad. And his family just loved on him through that. They came around him. They loved on him. Because what had happened was he had lost his routine. He loved his routine. He loved his job. He loved his, his house and his family and how things went. And when all that was taken away, it was like, what now? Have you ever had that happen? A time in your life where everything was taken away that maybe you hold dear, maybe it's some routine you hold dear in your life and, it, and it's, raw, it's taken from you and you feel out of control and you're struggling with how to get through the day because of that. This is where he was at. His, his family had to find a new routine for him. They got him a dog, they got him, he got another job. He had to get a new routine. You see, there was hope in the midst of that, but it was a hard, it was a hard, hard trial. How do we know the difference? Winston Churchill is probably credited as describing severe depression as a black dog howling. This is when there is like this black dog constantly howling, almost sitting on your chest, that there's this weight that it just nips at you. Every chance that there's something that should give you joy, you can't even get joy. You don't even get joy in food anymore. You don't even have joy being around people anymore. The things that you used to find pleasure in, there's no pleasure in it anymore. And you have this dark oppression that's over you. And, and that's how Winston Churchill described depression. And I, I, like, I like that because it kind of shows you the difference there. How do you know the difference? Is it this constant feeling of hopelessness, uh, fixation on past failures constantly? Uh, even even the, the thought of death comes, comes quick, comes easily, often. That is, that is clinical depression, and that is an, a, 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 so those are some reasons though you would want to see a psychologist, a counselor. But most of the time, most of the time, I got a book this last week, um, from Ryan, let me borrow uh, uh, Stressed Out, and by Todd Friel, I think is his name. And it was, it's a great book. He says this, he says, he talks about Winston Churchill in this, and he says this, he says, but most of the time it is not clinical depression. You see, because of our, our, our focus, over focus on often medication, we tend to over medicate. Did you know that in America, we have 311 million people in America and there are 253 million prescriptions for antidepressants in our country every year? We are being over prescribed. Doctors are starting to realize this. We're overprescribing because somebody comes with some feelings of depression and, and, and they don't know how to deal with it. They don't know how to cope, so just give them some drugs. 
I'm not saying that drugs are evil. Believe me, hear me on that. I believe that God can, God can give that as a blessing to somebody. My sister, if it weren't for psychiat- psychiatric drugs, she, would be, uh, she wouldn't be able to function. She needs it consistently in her life. And we look at it as a blessing from God because every good and perfect gift comes from God. Yet, we are being over-prescribed because we don't know how to deal with these issues Outside of that many times, so many people, even in the church, especially outside the church, there is no, there is no thought that, you know what, there is a, this, is, this could be a spiritual problem that I'm going through right now. And I need, I, need, I need some help spiritually with this. I need to go to the word of God. I need to, to, to let God heal these wounds that exist in my life right now. So the question is, when is it a sin you know, I, even mentioning this, this question online is, will bring about all kinds of almost attack. Whoa, how can it ever be a sin? It's depression. It can't. And, and I, again, that's why I say, when you say depression, a lot of people think all kinds of different things, right? But the scriptures command us, Philippians 4, 6, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, make your requests known to God. And then it says also in Philippians, rejoice always and again. These are commands to us as believers. We should be fighting for this. Whenever I've had a transition in my life, when it came to finding a new job position, before I came here to Riverside, I think Randy um, remembers this. I usually don't want people to know this. I, Heidi ended up telling Randy and Rita that I, that I was like feeling sick to my stomach. I always get physically sick whenever I have a major uh, change in my life. You know, it's like my cousin who was going through that. You know, I get physically sick, but man, I'm fighting for it. I'm wanting the joy of the Lord. I know that God's going to work all things for his good. I know that he's going to work it out. I know that, it's, that he's sovereign over this, but my physical body is just fighting me right now. And it starts to fight me, but it's a fight to, for the joy of the Lord, not just this wallowing in this, you know, confusion or anxiety. There's a difference there. And when we wallow in it, that's when it becomes a sin. When we accept it, when we, we want to be, you know, do you want to, to have joy? When we want to be depressed, when we, we, when we embrace it as part of who we are, this is just who I am, you know, that is when it, where it's dangerous. We need to say, listen, I'm struggling with this, but I want the joy of the Lord and I'm going to fight for it. I'm gonna fight for the joy of the Lord. Uh, Romans 8, 22 through 28 has a lot to say about this. I love this passage. It says this. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the spirit. We groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. You hear that word groaning coming up over and over again in that scripture passage? Friends, we all are groaning. We all have times of depression and sadness. We all have times of anxiety and confusion about life. And it's, it's part of the groaning that we're experiencing until we are, are going to experience the consummation where God returns and he re- redeems his people once and for all and everything is made right again. And it, Revelation says, for the former things are passed away. There will be no more tears or death or crying anymore. For the former things are passed away. Those things are going to pass away. And if we're trying to figure out a utopian society in this world, yes, we should fight for his kingdom come. Yes, we should want to love people and pursue righteousness, but we should not be surprised when the world isn't what we want it to be. 
We're groaning for that day, and yet we have faith and we have hope that he works all things for good for those who are called according to his purpose. You guys, that has been a rock verse in my life throughout many trials that I don't know what's going on. I don't understand why this has happened, but I'm going to trust that God is up to something And I'm going to wait on the Lord so that I can have the joy of the Lord, even if my own body is against me. Even if my own physical body is feeling sick out of this situation, I'm going to focus and and fix my mind on the Lord. There's a verse, back to that that, uh, Corinthians passage. Knowing that we will be, have anxious and sad thoughts, first we must figure out where they're coming from. If this is a psychological, clinical problem, or if this is more of a spiritual problem, then, so first you want joy, diagnose the problem, then fight with spiritual weapons. This passage is an awesome passage, you guys. 2 Corinthians 10, 4 through 5. Turn back to that with me if you've turned away from it. 2 Corinthians 10, 4 through 5, it says, For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. You guys, if I embrace anxiety and sadness, then a stronghold starts to form in my life. That is like a cancer that will not go away. So I don't embrace that. And, and how, do I, how do I not embrace it? How do I get it out when it wants to get there? When my sin nature wants to, to, to fear, an unhealthy type of a fear, how do I get it out? He says right here, how do we do it? For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God. One lofty opinion would be medicine will solve all your problems. That is one lofty opinion that we destroy on the authority of God's word. Not that medicine, we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater, but we recognize that there is much more going on here in our spirit and in our soul. And then what do we do? We we captivate, we capture those thoughts and we make them obedient to Christ. Now that word capture in the Greek, and hopefully I can get it right here, akmolotismo is the Greek word, and it means to take as a prisoner, okay, like a prisoner of war. You know what the Roman Empire did with a prisoner of war? A Roman, the Roman Empire would either kill the prisoner of war, or, especially if the prisoner of war had some use to them, they would then indoctrinate and, and educate that prisoner of war so that they can then use it for their own good, use that person for their own good. And that is what we do with our thoughts. They either need to die, Oh, we need to, to, to think about them some more and make them obedient to Christ. Let me give you an example, okay? Here's one that needs to be obedient. I can't do this. I can't do this. I can't make this feeling of joy in my heart. You're right, you can't do it. There's some truth there. Don't kill it. Don't kill that statement. But you make it obedient to Christ and you recognize that Christ can make it make you strong enough to defeat this in your life. Even if the enemy wants to tell you you can't do it. Now here's something that needs to die. I am a complete failure. I am a horrible, evil, yes we are, yes, we are sinful people, but you know what? God loves you and you are created in the image of God and you have great worth and great value or else he wouldn't have died on that cross. The enemy wants to say you're bad and you go, yeah, you're right, I am bad. They say, no, 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 you are, you are really bad. You can never be redeemed. That's what the enemy wants to say. God says, you know what? You're bad. We're all bad. All of us are. But Jesus has redeemed us from our sin. And he's shown us what, what we're worth. So those, those are an example. Another one. Marriage is hard. Yeah. Oh, yeah, right? So what does God want to do through this difficult trial in my marriage, me working with my spouse. What does he want to teach me through my spouse? We make that obedient to Christ. And then another one that we kill, if only I hadn't married this person. That is something that needs to die. We take those thoughts captive and we make them obedient to Christ. 
I want to give you some examples here in ending and closing. I was going to open it up for Q&A, and I ran out of time. The pages just kept getting longer and longer with this. If you have, if you have um, questions about this, please feel free to text, send me um, something over, over Facebook or whatever, and I would love to wrestle with it. I grow from it, so don't feel like I can't ask pastor a question, because no, like I grow through, through that. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask after this, the service sometime, sometime through the week if something comes to your mind. Uh, someone in our church said this. I'm going to give some examples of people that have gone through some really tough times. People that I respect, people that, that have the joy of the Lord. I thought through all of the people I know, and I thought, who are the people that I know that have the joy of the Lord? And what can we learn from these people? One person said this. I went through a really, really tough time where I was totally exhausted from work, and someone said a smart comment to me. It made me question my salvation. I started to, went into a deep, dark hole. I started to think that Christians don't have this problem. A Christian counselor helped me understand that our sins may be forgiven, but we sometimes carry emotional baggage from our past that can resurface in times of stress. I spent three years, now catch this word, fighting my way out of that long black tunnel. Scripture and a few good books helped. One of my big issues was the feeling of inferiority brought on by a critical person in my life. Would you believe that one of the things that God, that got me started on my turnaround was a simple sign that said, I know that I'm special because God don't make junk. That is how we battle. We, we make those thoughts captive. Inferiority? No. We make that captive to the fact that God doesn't make junk. Second, second one here. A friend from Oregon, this is a friend from Oregon, said Nehemiah 8.10 was her favorite verse. She is just filled with joy all the time. Which in Nehemiah 8.10 says, For the joy of the Lord is your strength. She mentioned praising God while she runs. Her mom taught her from a young age that God was always working for our good, even if it didn't feel good. This was huge to learn from a young age since her dad died when she was very little from a motorcycle accident. When I find myself being grumpy, I'm not usually being thankful or irritated by someone. I try to remind myself of something I like about them. When I was first married, I did a study on contentment, and it focused a lot on never using the what-if statements. What if I had only done that? Or, if only I had this. These statements do not usually take me anywhere positive or help me in my faith. They cause me to wish for things that are not in line with what God has for me now. Another friend from Oregon, the more I understand of the gospel, the happier I am and the more content I am. We as believers should really be the most joy-filled people in the world Connection to the body of Christ is critical for keeping our minds fixed on the realities of heaven. My brothers and sisters are constantly encouraging and pointing me back to the cross and to heavenly thinking. I try to return the favor. God has recently been teaching me that my expectations of the spirit and his work in my life have been too low. My joy has most definitely increased as my relationship with the Lord has become stronger. That should not be a surprise considering joy is a fruit of the Spirit. He has helped many people through depression, which caused him to read a lot of books on it. His favorite, oh, this is my friend, so I'm talking about my friend here. His favorite was that, that had the most impact on him was My Name is Hope, Anxiety, Depression, and the Life After Melancholy by John Mark Comer. So My Name is Hope by John Mark Comer. Okay, a friend from Washington said this, I fight for joy by focusing on all the things that I am thankful for that seems to keep coming up, which come to, which come to me unmerited. When I feel down about something, I go back to a list I made during Thanksgiving one year. This is from my cousin who was abducted as a sex slave in Japan and has overcome depression fears and anxiety by saturating her mind in the word. She says this, I was in and out of the hospital for years and at times I knew it was demonic oppression. Just knowing the depths of evil in the world can really bring you far down to a very low place. 
I started to read the word before bed and listen to it even while I was sleeping and it makes the nightmares go away even to this day. Saturate your mind in the word for the healing of your mind. I memorized every verse in the Bible on anxiety. I had to make a decision to forgive the Japanese mafia even though I didn't get justice due to the fact that the police told me that they would kill me and my family if I pursued the case. It really helped to start praying for them to be saved and this helped my depression in a major way. Forgiveness has an amazing impact in the heart of us. That's why Jesus commands us to forgive everyone. Even something as horrible as this, as horrific as this. She's actually spoken at Cedarville University on this topic. And lastly, this is from, um, I'll read it and then I'll tell you where it's from. Oh, this is from somebody in our church. I've had my share of sadness, anxiety, and joy. I lived through the Great Depression to share in depression and sadness, but was raised in a Christian home that taught me how to rise above the bad parts and be thankful for the good parts. When you don't have much materially, you appreciate it more as you work to get some of it honestly. Joy is like sunshine after the storm. You need testing in life to enjoy the blessings that follow. I love Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 as a basis for finding joy in the Lord. And of course, that is trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. I've been talking for a long time. This is a tough topic and we were going to end with some Q&A, but we're just gonna end with a prayer and then you will be dismissed, all right? Father, we come to your word as beggars longing for bread Lord, our minds are a complicated place. Our souls are complicated, Lord. Lord, you say that a man's heart are like deep waters and who can understand, but Lord, that you draw that out. And Lord, I pray that you would help us with sadness and anxieties. Lord, when situations come that are too big for us to handle, Lord, help us to cling to you. Help us to know that the real delights and joys in life that are everlasting come from your hands. And I pray that as we go from here, Lord, that that joy would just overflow to others around us who desperately need it. Help us to have that missional focus, Lord. It's not about us. It's about the impact that we can have in this lost and confused world. And it's ultimately about your glory. In your name we pray, amen. You're dismissed.